was very providential that uh, uh, you're singing, saying that song here as we look at 2 Timothy in chapter 4 and verses 1 through 5. And I'll go ahead and actually begin and let us stand as we look at this word together, God's word. I'll actually begin a little bit before that. And uh, we'll start with verse 16. This is one of those cases where really there's a chapter division, but it's not a good division. And it reminds us uh, of what's important as a work of a church and what God will bless. Um, there's a lot of things churches are doing today. And uh, there's one thing, though, that God has commanded us to do as a church. And, and we cannot neglect this. <coughs> Begin with... Uh, actually, uh, I'll go ahead and begin reading in verse 14. But you must continue in the things, this is of chapter 3 first, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And in chapter 4, verse 1, I charge you therefore before God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Please be seated. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, what Paul is making clear here is that Christ's church will be blessed, it will grow and benefit eternally only as much as God's word is preached and central in our life together. Think of how the church, early church grew. And Acts 1 and 2, what do we see? In fact, one pastor said it this way. He says, the church in Jerusalem was conceived in prayer and birthed in a sermon. It's not how the world does things, right? But we're not the world. That's why the apostles said, of all the works in the ministry, in Acts 6, 4, they said, we will devote ourselves to prayer and in the ministry and the word. Why? I said it this morning. We could have a packed church. If we announce next week, we'll give free oil changes. There's churches that do that. But the reality is, God, it's biblical preaching, is what God uses to bless, to convert hearts, and to truly grow his kingdom. So is it any surprise that really Paul, as he's writing, and we should know this, these are the very last words of Paul before he gets executed by the, the Roman Emperor Nero for preaching the gospel. And here Paul places his hope in the power of the Holy Scripture, God's Word. How about today? What's our hope in? What's our focus? In the 1990s, a famous sociologist, Robert Bella, did a study. It's published in a book. Uh, but, but it was a study about the religion of America. And, and he interviewed this woman. He called her Sheila. And he asked her, what drives you? She responded, I believe in God, but I'm not a religious fanatic. I can't remember the last time I went to church. And then using her name, she said, I call my faith Sheilism. Just my own little voice. The sociologist Bella, as a Berkeley sociologist, said, Shilaism is the religion of 300 million Americans. <laughs> He's the population of the country. Now, that's an overstatement, but I am afraid 
But God's condemnation in Judges is too often what he would say about our nation. Judges 21, 25, God said, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's the defining mark of far too many, including in the church. There's a reason. God, by the Holy Spirit through Paul, commands here, preach the word. Because his word is what the church needs to thrive and grow and be revived in, even in a day like our own. Paul tells Timothy, really, the reason why this is important. Then he explains what to preach. And lastly, we're, we're taught even how we are to respond to God's word. Now, why is biblical preaching so important? Paul writes passionately here in verse 1. He says, I charge you therefore before God. God's a judge. We're standing at the bar of God in a sense. And he says, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at the appearing of his kingdom. See, worship and all of our life is lived before God. But God is especially present in his church and among his people when his word is preached. That means my preaching, your, our confessions together that we say, the hymns we sing, the prayers we raise are all being listened to by God. He's here with us. And of all the people we, we, we seek for approval in our life, <laughs> we, must, we need God's approval more than anyone else's. We don't need the approval of those people in the world who think there's no absolute truth and yet get mad if the bank has their statement wrong. We don't need the approval of, uh, of what so many churches are seeking now to, to, to seek consumers of religion. We're not running after people who think the world revolves after themselves or around them. No, this is the church which, which Christ has purchased by his own blood. And, and so I have to preach primarily for the glory and pleasure of God. And, and you listen, not because I'm the most exciting minister in the world. I'm not. I'm pretty boring. My family can tell you that. But we do this for the pleasure of God. His glory. Because our Savior Jesus, who accomplished salvation by his righteous life and shed blood on the cross, will one day return. That's what Paul's saying. He's going to return as sovereign king to put down all rebellion and judge the living and the dead. And then we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, as 2 Corinthians 5 tells us. And this means what pleases God has to override everything else, starting right here. In worship, it overrides what the world wants. It overrides even sometimes maybe what our heart desires. And it makes us realize we've got to look at this time together differently. This is not a social club. We don't come to church looking for what's in it for me. We've got to ask what's in it for God. And, and we need to order our life and prioritize and, and repent to get ready for Christ's return. One of the things I saw in, in Bali, Uganda, was the king's vacation home. And, and when the king came, the people were kind of happy in some ways and annoyed other times because what, what happened is the speed bumps were removed, which they liked, but, but, but the potholes were repaired, the city was cleaned up and put in order, and there was a lot of work that had to be done. Well, Paul's telling us, Christ is coming, and there's no time to waste. We're to prepare with a holy motivation to preach God's word, to really worship him, and to live for his glory, not our own. Because one day, God is going to hold me as your preacher in particular. But he's going to hold each one of you as well, accountable. And we know salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But this is a call for you and I. It's not a call. This is a demand for you and I to be, have thankful obedience of true faith. 
that we realize we want to hear the words of Christ. We want to hear Christ preached. And we want Christ to hear that. To have him responded to by faith, believed, and lives transformed. And again, we should want that because Christ is physically coming again one day, even though he's spiritually present with us. This is why Paul, even with his great failing, still strove to preach God's word, knowing as we should. And we didn't read it, but you go down in the book, in the Bible here, and, and look at verses 8 through 9. He says, this is, this is why he's doing everything. He says, finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, our righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. Are you loving and living? Are you worshiping with a mind to the fact that Christ will stand among us one day? Does your worship in life show it? That we have an audience today even in our worship ultimately of one, (laughs) one triune God. Does my preaching show that? Secondly, what is to be preached? Because that's really Paul's focus, even as he gives us one command that, and then has a, these other things that are built on this command. He says in verse 2, preach the word. Think about how God's word is so important. Look at the scripture, and the very first thing you see is God's word being spoken and the universe exploding into being. God wrote his words on on tablets of stone on Mount Sinai. We read those commandments. Our covenant-making God has spoken to you and I clearly. In fact, Hebrews 1 even summarizes all of God's dealing as as him speaking to us. It says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. God has revealed himself by his spoken word. That means I don't have a right. A preacher does not have the right to say, well, that's nice, and set it aside. I got something better to talk to, talk about. Now, God is pleased, Romans 10, 14 shows even, to speak by the faithful preaching of his word. And the word there in the Greek, the preach, uh, that, that Paul uses is really to herald. Uh, I know this is kind of foreign to us, but a herald was, was a king's messenger who had to speak the king's words. Nothing else. You know what? That's our task as a church, too, as a pastor for me particularly, is to speak the word of God. That's why the very end of the Bible ends with the fact that we're not to add or take away from God's word. But sadly, what are preachers preaching today? What can I be tempted to preach? Preach ourselves, our weekend, Preach about a dog, our dog, or our kids. There's preachers trying to be edgy. They, they've dressed up as clowns. They, they act out a, a Bible character. I remember that when I was a kid. They intersperse movies into sermons and, or, or make a sermon, a comedy session. Others preach what, what God's going to do for you as if he's some sort of divine slot machine in the sky so that you can have your best life now. I don't want my best life now. <laughs> But you never see Jesus preaching like this. It says he preached repentance in the kingdom of God. And in Luke 24, we read, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus taught all the word of God. because it, He taught the whole Bible because it takes a whole Bible to be a Christian. You never see Jesus, actually there's one thing you never see Jesus doing besides sinning. So okay, two things. You never see him laughing in the Bible. He doesn't sit there and say, well, you know, I got to tell you guys, you know, (laughs) funny thing, you know, two rabbis walked into a bar. He never does that. Why? Because the preaching of, of the word of God is serious business. 
Salvation in Christ or everlasting damnation is at stake. I, I think about this. When you go in to the ER, if a doctor came with a red nose on and, and, and having the whole staff in stitches, when someone's life hung in the balance, what would you think? To be honest, I would think I need to go to a different hospital. God is calling for bold, clear, faithful preaching of his word in season and out of season, when people want to hear and when they don't. And while humor has a place, the purpose of preaching, Paul lays out here, is to convince, it's to rebuke, it's to exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. Preaching should show people where their lives are not in line with God's word and help them to seek God's spirit and wisdom to make the necessary corrections. And it's to be done patiently. Because you think about it, we know it from our own life. I said this to a man a long time ago. God has been patient with us. We have to be patient with others. This is long ago in a far different church. Just understand, what Paul's saying is what we do here is not about what people want to hear. It's about what you and I need to hear. You know, in the 19th century, it was interesting. You look back in the history, and I, I wanted to bring out some, but I, I don't have the time. There, preaching was popular. People would literally go from church to church to hear different preachers all on a Sunday. They spent the whole day doing this in England and Scotland. In Acts day, or in, in Paul's day, in Acts, he preached into the night. But our day is not like that. What do people say? People say, don't preach to me. Don't give me a sermon. That's what our, our, our conversations uh, sometimes say, or people say in the conversations. Why? Well, God tells us the reason why. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, he says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We're going through this series, seeking for God to bless us. It's really the purpose of it. And if we want God to work among us, it's not about us becoming more like the world or a comedy club. We need to desire the milk and meat of this word. That's why Paul tells this young Pastor Timothy, preach the word. And that's true for every preacher. For anybody to be a true preacher, that's what they have to do. And the reality is God's promise to bless that. Isaiah 55, 11 says, So shall my word be that goes from my mouth. Hmm. Not just talking about the written word, but his prophets as they preach the word. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Go through the scripture, you'll see. Look at Second Chronicles. I mean, over and over. I mean, that, I admit that's one of the books that sometimes we hesitate to look at. Uh, but, but really, you see there, over and over, ministers being sent out. Jehoshaphat, look, look at his uh, role in that in Second Chronicles. He sent out ministers who, who took the book of the law, and, and God brought reformation and revival through it. You see it through Josiah. You see it through others. Uh, go even further elsewhere in the Old Testament. Ezra preached God's word, and the priests joined him. And what happened? We read in Nehemiah 8.8, 8, and it says, So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. That's what preaching does. It's reading and explaining the Bible the very words of God written for us. Sometimes that's going to declare you're sinning against God. Repent. And I know that's not pleasurable. One pastor a long time ago said, don't tell people they sin. It'll hurt their self-conscience. Or self-esteem, sorry. But as another pastor, William Barclay, wrote, any teachers whose teaching tends to make men think less of sin and I would include less of Christ, is a menace to mankind. 
See, when sin is made to be little, our need of Christ and the importance of his saving work is downplayed. We need to have the word preached to our hearts. Just so you know, I listen to like four sermons a week with far better pastors than me. Lastly, how must we respond to biblical preaching? I use that, taking that really from Paul's warning in in verses 3 through 4 when he talks about the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. There's there's a positive way to look at that too, obviously. He's he's warning Timothy here. What does that mean? It means we should love doctrine. We should love the truths of God's word. We have to turn away from stories and fables. I can't tell you how many sermons I've heard at funerals which are filled with stories and nothing of the Word of God. There's no hope there. So how are you and I to to respond to preaching? Just so you know, again, we, we need to do this. We need to listen knowing our life depends on what we're doing right here, right now. You know, the truth is that way. Our life depends on the truth, doesn't it? How many of us have sat on a plane as the stewardess goes through? This is how you buckle your seat. This is how you pull the oxygen mask down. <coughs> kind of fall asleep. You look at anything else. You know, I, you know how many of us have, have looked at instructions about a plane? You know, we pull that out and just to ignore the, 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 the stewardesses or the steward. But you know what? And that plane starts plunging to the ground. What's going to become very, very important? Those instructions. And loved ones, every Lord's Day, we need to realize our life depends on the teaching of God's Word. Jesus prayed for you and I this way. Sanctify them in the truth. Thy Word is truth. That means it has to be central in our worship, in our lives. We need the word of God preached if we're to be holy and see God. This is why it's a serious issue. Uh, Ephesians 6 tells us our battle, that that we're living in a battle. It's not with political parties or or, or people that are standing against us. It, It is against principalities and the forces of darkness. See, too many go through life without a thought of the dangers we face or are the God who is faithful and merciful to sinners like us. We're oblivious to it. In high school, we had a soccer game in Paris. And uh, I, I, so we were just off the Champs-Elysees, just down from the Arc de Triomphe, and we decided, some friends of mine and I, we decided to go watch a movie. It was Tarzan. I still remember what it was. We watched the whole movie. It was okay. We walk out, and there's firemen all around us. And they're walking back into the movie theater. There was a fire, and we didn't even know it. Nobody told us. We were oblivious, not just because we're teenage boys. (laughs) How many live this life oblivious? Something far worse than a fire, the eternal fires of hell lapping at their feet. We can't be oblivious to the fact that heaven and hell is before us and everyone you meet. We need the words of life. We need to know thy word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path because there's so many pits of sin around us. And it's only biblical preaching that's going to show our needs, show our hearts, show the world as it is, and most of all, our God as he really is. This is what Jesus promised to use to to build his church by. It wasn't by Peter. It was by the confession of his word. And I know the default setting of our own hearts is always to move more and more away from the truth. I mean, we've got Hollywood. We've got all these uh, special effects and that uh, wows us. But Paul warns, as he does elsewhere, that we also have in this life As the human heart moves away from the truth, we have wolves and false teachers, and that's why we need to cling to the word of God. 
Preach Christ. Paul told Timothy, that's what you need to demand. And if we think, well, I don't have time for this, we've got, you know, think about all the time we spend in the week watching games or TV shows. <laughs> we need to repent of that. Not that it's always wrong to do that, but, but saying we don't have time for God. Because God's given his word to tear down, to bind wounds, to show himself as the only anchor in all of our life, in all of, uh, of the situations. He's our only help. He's our only hope. This God, who, who in mercy loves sinners like us and acts for our salvation, this is his love letter to you and I. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God calls us, first of all, the preacher, to preach the word. And we need to see him to give us listening ears because his word will teach us to love what God loves, to walk in his ways, to confess his name, trust him. And that, that's salvation. After a famous preacher, Jean-Baptiste Massillon, preached, one man exclaimed, what an eloquent servant, a sermon. He was a very well-known preacher in France. Later, Massillon replied, then he, when he heard what was stated, he said, then he did not understand me. Another sermon has been thrown away. He was pointing to Jesus, pointing out his word. And the point of what we're doing here is not seeking eloquent sermons, but a message from God's word. Settle for nothing less. Because heaven, and hell, heaven or hell is only one unsuspecting heartbeat away. That's why we need to listen. We need to obey. We need to believe. We need God's word because by grace, we want to hear those words which are promised on that great day of Christ's return. What are those words? You're not going to know it unless you look at the Bible. It's well done, thou good and faithful servant. With eternity in view, preaching of the word, hearing it, trusting, obeying it is of the utmost importance. It's what God blesses. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it is amazing that you entrust us, sinful men and women, with this most precious possession of your word, this jewel of your unfailing word. Your word, which is like the refiner's fire, the hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. And we pray, Lord, forgive us for those times that we think that we need something different. Give us a deeper reverence for your word, even the preaching of it, so that we would love it more, read it, memorize it, hide in our hearts, defend and proclaim it always before the world and understand that the way the church truly grows is revived and transformed is by your word. Not by seeking the world. And so we pray for this church that we would every, in every sense of the word be a Bible church for your glory and so that we would be useful in your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.